here in Australia and three job search ideas that had worked very well for me and, I'm sure, will work, to a great extent, for all new migrants in 2022 and beyond. I came to Melbourne, Australia, from Malaysia, in 2004. On the Sunday morning of October 31, 2004, I boarded my flight at Clea. The airport was unexpectedly crowded. As it turned out, Anwar just got back from his medical treatment in Germany. I was in my early 30s then and having worked in the area of industrial sales and export marketing for the most part of my career and, for a short while, in the area of human resource development and language training. I gravitated towards the idea of finding a marketing-related job as soon as I landed. My first port of call was of course the local public library. There, I scanned all the newspaper's job advertisement sections I could lay my hands on. I also registered myself at the local job agencies and signed up with all the popular job search websites back in the day. I realized that it wasn't as easy as I had expected to land myself a decent marketing-related job. One of the key reasons, I think, is that I did not have enough in-depth industrial experience and technical knowledge in any specific area. In the eight years that I had been working in Malaysia, I did not stay long enough in any of the jobs that I had worked in to gain a deep enough level of expertise. Malaysians are blessed with the ability to speak several languages. But this advantage might not stand out as much as I'd like it to stand out as far as the jobs that I had tried to apply for are concerned. I was looking for jobs that required the job candidates travel overseas, especially to countries where Mandarin, Cantonese, Malay and Indonesian are being spoken. Why? An elderly friend who had been living there for more than 10 years at that time told me that it would be more advantageous for Australian companies to send their Caucasian marketing people to Asia. For example, the Chinese importers of wine in China would be less inclined to adopt a tough stance during business negotiations with their Australian counterparts who are Caucasians. But if they were dealing with a Malaysian who represents an Australian company, the Chinese importers will not be that easy on them. You can say this is all a matter of conventional perception but as we all know, perceived reality is in every way reality in its very own right. Think about it for a moment. Don't we, Asians, always fall prey to such an erroneous and distorted way of looking at things. Once there was a company trying to win a tender for the CLIA project. Its first attempt failed because the architect was a local Malaysian. Later, this company employed an Australian architect. And it managed to secure the job. Same blueprint, same plan. Only the architect was different this time. Anyway, back to my story. After a few rejections, I decided to try a different category of jobs. Lesser pay but more vacancies and a higher perceived chance of success. Call center jobs. I managed to get a casual outbound phone marketing research job with a French-Australian market research company in Hawthorne. I worked there for a few months on and off depending on project availability. Later, I used key search words such as Mandarin and Cantonese in my online job search. I then landed myself a job with a call center, with its HQ in Denver, Colorado. Outsourced by Telstra, the national telecommunication carrier. My job is to take inbound language calls which means calls from Telstra clients or prospective clients who speak language other than English. I had to learn how to navigate as many as seven windows while talking to my clients dealing their account-related issues. It was quite a tough job because the KPIs were ambitious, clients impatient and team leaders highly pressured by their management team to deliver. I have seen my female colleagues broke down because clients were shouting at them over the phone. I have seen male colleagues arguing with their clients at the top of their voices. Crazy, to say the least. Around that time, I have also came across news, on the media, of call center staff who committed suicides due to impossible KPIs. Even though our calls were of an inbound nature, we're still required to sell. We had to upsell our clients' phone plans, this and that. So, there's indeed a sales target to fulfill. Yet at the same time, we're not allowed to talk more than a certain number of minutes. I think it's 10 minutes, if I'm not wrong. Or maybe a maximum of 15 minutes. That's called ACT, I think, average call time. A few months into it, I decided that this was not for me. There must be better ways for me to add value here. I started to aggressively scan the job market again. That was when I decided to become a college teacher. Because those jobs popped up a lot. Like everyone else, I reverse engineered. Three things, in general, are imminent here as far as being a college teacher is concerned. The first thing I needed is a recognized qualification in the area of expertise in which I want to teach. For example, if I want to be a management teacher at a Taft college, I must have at least a bachelor degree in business management or a business degree with management as my major. A master degree is of course even better. But some colleges do specify that they need at least a master's degree. This has been increasingly the case over the years now though, personally, I don't think it is that necessary. The second qualification I needed is a teaching qualification. It is called Certificate 4 in Training and Assessment. This qualification allows you to teach adult, and young adult, learners. What is Cert 4? 
it is simply a qualification that is one level below diploma. For example, in the area of cleaning, or plumbing, or teaching, or finance, or let's say, hairdressing, the lowest level is cert I in cleaning slash plumbing slash finance etc. Then you have cert 2, 3 and 4 and then diploma. And then advanced diploma. And then you have degree, postgraduate diploma, masters, so on and so forth. This cert 4 can take as little as 6 months or even 3 months whereby you had to attend the course at an institution or university or an RTO, registered training organization, that offers it and then at the end of that course, you will do one major assignment. You submit it and if you are NYC, E. Not yet competent, you will be asked to resubmit until you get through it. The third thing I needed is the working with children check. For Victoria, you should visit this link home, working with children. If you're in NSW, please visit apply for a working with children check, service NSW. If you are in Perth, Google will help you find the WA equivalent. You know what to do. Once the three boxes were ticked I started sending out my applications. It did not take me long to land myself a college teaching job. That college was on Flinders Street. It was called the Meridian International Hotel School. I taught management-related subjects in their Diploma of Hotel Management, Diploma of Hospitality and Diplomé Patisserie. I worked there from April 2006 until end of 2008. Shortly after I left Meridian, it collapsed. I was lucky to be working in another private college in the city. With some years of college teaching experience, I decided to try for more established institutions. Permit Business Taft School advertisements were very appealing. But a senior colleague told me that it's almost impossible to work in Remit Business Taft School. I was not qualified enough, he said. In fact, he said, we're not qualified enough. I applied. Failed. Indeed he was right. But a few weeks later, another position came up again. Also from Remit. I applied. I got in. There, I met a colleague who rejected a job offer from North Melbourne Institute of Technology in Epping. It was too far for him. I took that job. It was quite well paid. Although not a permanent full-time position, I had good hours. I taught there once a week. Six hours of teaching. At a rate of $120 per hour. At that time, it was pretty high. The CBD based from it was paying us around $60 per hour. A few years later, I moved on to an even more reputable institution. This time not a TAF college but a college from one of the best universities in Victoria. I teach mainly international students who graduated from high schools and are new to Australia. They come in to prepare for their degree courses. This is where I find my skills and knowledge, academic, industrial and cultural and linguistic, were being put into best use. If you are new to Australia or are planning to migrate here and have not decided what jobs to choose, I'd suggest you give college teaching a try. College teaching requirements are easier to obtain. More or less just the three things mentioned above. Not so for secondary and primary school teaching. Now, you need to have a master's of teaching degree. This will take five years, if you do it part-time. But the bright side is that after the pandemic, school teachers are in serious shortage. Anyway, let me share three strategies, or rather, ideas I have used to get into my first college teaching job. I think they have greatly helped me. When you had no teaching experience to show for in your first college teacher job interview, what do you do? Here's how I thought it through, back in late 2005 and early 2006. I had to show that I was passionate in teaching. I had to break some convention here. The conventional notion is that your non-paid volunteer experience doesn't count. No use putting it down in your CV or cover letter. Some job ads even spelt out clearly that you should not put your volunteer experience down as your relevant work experience. As I said, I knew I had to break some rules. I had to defy convention. Strategy number one. Be a volunteer teacher and put that down in my job application cover letter and CV, even though I was not supposed to. I found work as a volunteer English tutor with Ames, Adult Migrant Education Services, a government initiative set up to help migrants with their English and job-related qualifications. After a two-evening training, I was assigned to teach English once a week to an Afghan couple based in Scoresby, Victoria. I sometimes helped them read letters as well. One time, I explained a letter that gave them instructions on how to vote in the coming election. I explained that they can choose the candidates they want to vote for or the party they wanted to vote for. They told me no. I had no time for any party on Saturday mornings. Very busy, they said. So I had to explain the different types of parties in the English dictionary. It was a very good experience for me. Even if it is not for purposes related my job search, I felt it's something most new migrants should or can consider. You see, as a new migrant from Malaysia myself, I sometimes felt lost and helpless starting my new life from scratch in the Australia I started to call home. But when I met my two Afghan students who were living with their elderly parents, one of them mobility impaired, and a small child and could not speak even a short sentence in comprehensible English, I suddenly felt that I really didn't have too many reasons to feel sorry for myself. 
I was 10 months into my AIMS volunteering experience when I applied for my first teaching job at Meridian. I asked my AIMS boss to write me a testimony. In that testimony, the duration of my experience was officially 10 months. But in truth, I was doing it only for once a week, one hour each time. That totals up to only 40 hours. But on paper, it was 10 months. Only two months short of one year. Figure that. Strategy number two. Paste a colored photo of yourself on the letter head of your cover letter and CV. On my cover letter and CV, I copied and pasted a photo of myself. I placed it on the op center of the page as part of my letter head template. A HR professional specialized in recruitment and job interview related processes once told me that according to the convention in corporate Australia, we must not have photos on our job application documents. I said to myself, that's even better. That means nobody else will compete with me. That will make my application stands out even more. My logic is that when you see a business card or a document that has the face of the author, you are more likely to connect with that person and the writings will surely be more credible when you know what the person looks like. By the way, how many recruiters are aware that you are not supposed to have photos on your CV or cover letter? And even if they do know, will they really mind or care, as long as you can show them that you are adequately and suitably qualified for the job position? Strategy number three. Print out a hard copy of your cover letter and CV and post it out to the recruiter in a good old-fashioned postal way with postage stamps glued to the top right corner of your handwritten envelope. Are you crazy? You might think, who does things like that anymore today? The answer lies exactly within your question, actually. When everyone else apply for their jobs electronically, your job application letter that came in through the Australia Post route will be the most interesting letter of the day. Think about it, what types of postal letters they receive other than their utility bills or some legal documents these days. Isn't that too boring? Your letter will bright up their days. For a change, they are opening a different type of envelope. Having said that, I don't mean you do not also apply electronically. You do both. Your letter will be the only job application that sits on the desk of the decision maker waiting to be physically held and read. I did that and the head of school at Meridian was impressed. He thought, and told me that I had creatively marketed myself. That was back in 2006. Now is 2022. The contrast cannot be more stark, can it? If you have other job search ideas, please share them with me. They will always be helpful especially when competition is so stiff now. Good luck, my friend. I can be reached at ksung at hotmail.com. Happy to help whenever I can. Warm regards. Ken Sung.